Okay, thank you. What what Gemma didn't say is that I am a I am a historian by, by origin. My first degree, my PhD are in history. And in a way, my sort of career is it's almost coming full circle from um, having been a historian through university management, being an academic looking at university management, and a, a sort of renewed interest in higher, educa in higher education and history of higher education. Uh, and that's the background to today's uh, talk. If, um, <coughs> if at any stage you get a bit bored listening to me, I've just brought along with me, just to sort of add to the atmosphere in a way, I, I collect old postcards of universities. Uh, and I have brought with me 30, and I know there's 30, <laughs> um, um, postcards which are sort of pictures of universities taken from the years either immediately before the First World War or during the First World War. So they are sort of relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. And as I say, if you get bored listening to me, then by all means, I'll pass them out. Uh, do just, yeah, just, just look at them casually while I'm, while I'm talking. That's absolutely fine. Um, but uh, uh, some of them, I have to say, are worth a few pounds. Um, but uh, anyway, they're, they're hopefully they're of interest. Uh, <clears throat> what I should also add is that the work I'm going to talk about today is basically was funded by two research grants that I got when I was at Liverpool before coming here. Uh, one from the Society for Research in Higher Education and the other from the Economic History Society. Um, what I want to do is, you know, when you talk about the history of higher education in this country, there's certain key things that stand out to you. Um, Robin's report, um, I'd throw in 1981, the, the first really massive e economies in higher education. Um, you could talk about the abolition of the binary divide, you could talk about Deering, you could talk about introduction of fees. There's a number of sort of key turning points that people will talk about. Very few people will talk about 1918 and the First World War. Um, and so that's going to be the center of my attention today. What I want to do is really three things in the next sort of 45 minutes or so. I want to talk about, I want to paint a picture of what universities were like before the First World War, at the outbreak of the war. So what were they like in the lead up to 1914? I want to talk a bit about what happened during the First World War, some of the pressures, how universities coped. And as you all hear, Towards the end of the war, a lot of attention began to focus on what things were going to be like after the war, both within the universities themselves and within government. And that was the lead up to the university's delegation, 23rd of, of November 1918, just a week or so after the armistice. Um, and for me anyway, that was quite a key turning point. It was the culmination of a lot of the discussions that have been happening in the second half of the war. So that's what I want to try and do. Um, let's start by looking at what were universities like before the First World War. Um, there had actually been a lot of change in the, in the late 19th century and in the years immediately before the war, a lot of change. Oxford and Cambridge, lots of legislation in government about Oxford and Cambridge, really shifting power um, within Oxford and Cambridge. Some people would say still not shifted enough, uh, but away from the colleges towards the centre of the university. Uh, also opening up Oxford and Cambridge for uh, a wider range of, of views, getting away from the sort of church dominated Oxford and Cambridge. There was a lot happening in London. Uh, lots of discussions about the federal nature of the University of London. Uh, very controversial establishment of Imperial College in 1907, uh, which really um, 
it's a very interesting case because the government got directly involved in the establishment of Imperial College, whereas higher education was seen very much as something that was outside of the interests of government at the time. Uh, government did begin to get involved with Imperial College. Uh, in the 19th century, you had the emergence of university colleges around the country, um, many of which then grew into universities that we're familiar with today. So you had things like Owens College, established in Manchester in 1851, Yorkshire College, which was in Leeds in 1874, Mason College, Birmingham, and so on. Several, a range of university colleges set up. These were not universities. They did not have university charters. They were university colleges, and they were really teaching um, programs preparing students for examinations through the University of London or through Oxford and Cambridge. You had colleges set up in Wales. Key date for me, if you're looking at sort of lead up to First World War, 1880, establishment of the Victoria University. Um, Victoria University, which was a federal university, bringing together effectively Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool. Uh, all broke up in acrimony in 1903, uh, basically because the, pe the people running the universities in Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool could not get on with each other. This was all wrapped up with civic rivalries, um, so nothing's changed much there. Um, you also had Federal University in Wales. Some of those university colleges in the lead up to the First World War became independent universities. Birmingham was the first in 1900, followed shortly by Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, as Victoria University Manchester broke up. Sheffield and Bristol also got charters before the First World War. Uh, places like Reading, Southampton, Exeter uh, were university colleges but did not get university status at that time. And of course, actually had to wait many years after the uh, indeed after the Second World War, before they got university status. So there was quite a lot happening in those years at that time. But there were pressures for change. I just mentioned three, there's it's a wider picture than this, but first of all you had to look at what was happening within the world of education, school education. Forster's famous Education Act 1870, 1902 Education Act, you began to have the development of a sort of proper secondary school system of, of education, and that then drove demand. So in those years immediately before the First World War, there were signs of growing interest in universities and growing demand for places. That was linked also to the suffragette movement, obviously, before the First World War and growing, growing demands for increasing opportunities for women to enter higher education. Um, it was also a time of growing concern about Britain's sort of position in the world. Um, there was a feeling that Britain was beginning to lag behind economically and militarily. Um, you had some of the sort of, this comes into the sort of politics of the, of the time, um, in particular Joseph Chamberlain, who was instrumental in development of the University of Birmingham, arguing very much that, you know, Britain needed to develop its universities if it was to compete effectively on the world stage. So you had this beginning before the war of this sort of pent-up demand, uh, growing pressures on universities. Um, for, for expansion. Still, however, the government was very much on the sidelines, not really involved in this discussion at all. So what did a university look like? Uh, one of the universities I've done a lot of work on is the University of Leeds. Um, so let's just have a very quick snapshot of what the University of Leeds looked like in 1914 on the outbreak of the war. In 19, for the session 1913-14, they had just over 1,000 students, 1,065 students. Um, that, would have looked very, that would have been very shade smaller than Liverpool and Manchester, shade bigger than Sheffield. So, but that wasn't untypical. 
Oxford and Cambridge, around about 4,000 each at the time, but a very different type of university. So Leeds, just over 1,000 students, predominantly undergraduate, 95% of them undergraduate. Interest, six, two thirds of them full time. So quite a large number of those students are actually studying part time for their degrees. Um, dominate 81% male, but actually the breakdown is more subtle than that. Um, so if we'd been looking at the Faculty of Arts in, in 1914, it was about 50-50. Um, but other subjects were strongly male dominated. Um, so again, you know, there are certain similarities to fairly recent years in, in universities. Um, men certainly would have dominated medicine, they would have dominated law, um, and they would have dominated engineering. Um, but, you know, 81% male. What's interesting, of course, is that almost all of those thousand students were local. Uh, they were, it was dominated by students who lived at home. The university before the war had developed a few very small hostels uh, for students coming from further afield, but they were dominated by home-based students who you know, came into the university each day and went home in the evenings. And home meant not just Leeds, but across the whole of the West Riding. So if you look at the records of, of student registrations before the war, which I've done, uh, you'll see students coming into Leeds regularly from the likes of Bradford, Huddersfield, Halifax, up towards York, um, and from other parts of the West Riding, um, Castleford, that sort of area. Um, so these were predominantly day students. Age range is interesting. They had a number of students who were 16 years old. That would have been fairly common in those days in, in many of the universities. Um, but equally, 40% were aged over 21. So the age spread of students in a, in a university like Leeds before the war was fairly broad sort of spread. And at the same time as delivering some degree programs, by this time, Leeds was offering degrees in its own right, um, but there was a huge commitment to other activities as well. Extension classes, evening courses, um, academics from the University of Leeds before the war would give public lectures uh, in the sort of communities of the West Riding um, and would regularly attract audiences of three, four hundred people. Um, you know, this was quite big before the war, this sort of activity. So that's, that's a sort of picture of the university leads before the war. Just picking up a couple of other quick points. Um, what, did they, what did the university look like financially? Well, this is Liverpool in the year before the war. Um, you can't see the detail, but let me just pick a few key points. This block here, which is roughly a quarter of all the income to the university. That's fees. Need to bear in mind that in many ways, the universities before the war looked more like um, you know, private institutions. Okay. No. So fees were very important. Uh, and universities charged a wide range of different fees. Uh, it wasn't just one flat rate fee. Uh, you had to pay for examinations. You had to pay for courses that you studied. Uh, you had to pay for all sorts of other bits and pieces. Uh, it wasn't just a single fee. And in aggregate, the fees made up about a quarter of the total income. Many of the fees that were paid went directly to the lecturers and to the professors. They didn't go to the university. They were paid directly. They were part of the employment conditions for lecturers and professors at the time. This one, 
is the money they got from government. So about a quarter again was government funding. Again, made up from a wide range of different sources. So it wasn't just one grant to the university. It was made up from many, many different sources. Uh, so you'd get a grant, if I take the Liverpool as an example rather, you would, they would get a grant from the Board of Education for teacher training. They would get a grant from the Board of Agriculture for anything to do with, with farming or food. Um, they, would get what, they would get some sort of grant from government, um, but it was predominantly given, part of the sort of psychology, was that it was given as a sort of pump priming. Grants were first introduced uh, for universities in 1889, and they were given to try and incentivize further philanthropy and donations. And this area here, these two boxes put together, representing about another quarter of income, were endowments and philanthropic gifts. Um, Liverpool, like other universities at the time, had a list of subscribers. Local people would make annual payments to their university to support their local university. Um, very important. And this one is also quite interesting. That's local authority grants. Um, local authorities would give money to their local university to support their local university, to encourage their university to run programs that were linked to local industry and local employment. So what you have there is quite a diverse range of different sources. And Liverpool, that's Liverpool. Liverpool, would have, the, the financial profile would have looked very similar across most of the universities in the country, the only two exceptions really being Oxford and Cambridge. Um, so that's income. Expenditure, uh, that's Edinburgh before the war. Again, actually, you'd see a very similar picture today, dominated by staffing, that's staff expenditure. Um, so nothing much has changed there. But the, the conclusion I just want to draw from these, those two pictures of the expenditure and income is actually how vulnerable the universities were before the war. A quarter of that money coming from fees, income from fees, a quarter from, from philanthropic giving, um, another just about 20% from local authorities. Uh, there was a vulnerability there. And add that to uh, that sort of picture where there's actually... Was that me? No, it wasn't you. Don't worry. <laughs> What I'm saying, expenditure dominated by staffing, income very sort of mixed, equals actually a vulnerability. If, though, if, if something was to happen to the fee side of things, then the, the universities were going to be in trouble. And of course, go right back to one of the earlier slides, um, a lot of these universities were new, they hadn't built up the reserves and the endowments that say Oxford and Cambridge and Durham for that matter had, um, they were new, they were vulnerable. So, I'll skip that. Let me just say a little bit finally, to finish the picture of research before the war, of universities before the war, say a little bit about research. Um, research was not really coordinated, it was a relatively low priority. Um, there was some dedicated funding available from government departments for specific work. There was no sort of underpinning funding. It was very much project-based funding. Um, and I couldn't resist putting that quotation in uh, from a, uh, a professor at, at Leeds, because again, uh, it just sort of shows how little has changed. Uh, 1913, he was complaining about uh, his inability to do research, and he said, the increasing demands in the way of university organization, senate, board of science, and committee meetings, meetings of governors of schools, the multifarious demands of a department which requires supervision, the ordering of apparatus and chemicals, 
all in addition to lectures, the examination of notebooks, etc., make any kind of steady research work an impossibility. Uh, I suspect you would hear similar words from some heads of department and others uh, today. Um, so, you know, that was 1913. Um, research often depended on the sort of voluntary work of undergraduate students. Um, I sort of characterized research before the war as very much with, with the exception of some people in some sort of engineering departments, it was very much the preserve of enthusiasts. It was people who could find some way of funding it from their own uh, resources. Okay, so that is a quick picture of universities before the, before the war. As far as the war itself is concerned, I argue that there are two phases, two quite readily identifiable phases during the war. You had the period from the outbreak of war, August 1914, through to the middle of 1916, so almost two years. It was a period of crisis. Um, it was a period, we'll see a bit more in a minute, uh, of dramatically reduced student numbers because the men went off to, the, initially they volunteered to fight in the, in the war, subsequently they were conscripted to fight in the war, uh, and certainly by the start of 1916, you could barely find a male student in any university in the country, with the exception of medical students who had special provision uh, to, to stay on their courses uh, because of the shortage of doctors. Um, so you had quite dramatic reductions in student numbers, and that, of course, caused funding problems. Go back to what I said about the vulnerability before the war. Uh, well, that is exactly what happened. You saw dramatic reductions in student numbers, and so you had income reducing as well. And those first years of the war uh, were, see, were, were really seen as, as, as a crisis within the universities. Um, part of it, I think, was because there really was no precedent. Um, some people made references back to, the, to some of the issues in the Boer War, but that really was of different scale. Um, really, there was no precedent. The universities had to sort of make things up as they went along in response to the outbreak of war. Phase two, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, after 1916 was very much when they were looking forwards. Uh, and that's the build up uh, to the great meeting in November 18, which we'll end by talking about. And it was a time of growing confidence and actually looking to the future. They'd reached some sort of stability in terms of finances, and I'll say a bit more in a second uh, about that. And actually, by 1916, some universities were returning annual financial surpluses. Uh, and also, towards the end of the war, student numbers began to pick up again. Um, but uh, there's two very clear phases. So, uh, impact of the war, no, no precedents, no preparation. If I just look at Liverpool here for a quick example, student numbers at Liverpool fell by 28%. And of course, it hadn't been foreseen. Um, so it fell by, by 28%. Uh, fee income fell by 31%. Um, and total income by 8%. Um, and they were in a vulnerable position and they didn't know what to do. Uh, there are some lovely letters from vice chancellors to other vice chancellors, uh, sort of saying, oh, well, no, what, do we, what do we do? How do we cope with this? What are you doing? You know, can we, can we share from you and, and hear what you're doing as well? Um, and that actually is quite significant because before the war, the universities have very much been like little islands. Um, and the war immediately started forcing them to talk to each other. Uh, to, to sort of share how they were getting around things. And it wasn't just financial. 
they had all sorts of changes to make to regulations. So, you know, the, 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 let's say the male student who was halfway through his degree in 1914 and then goes to volunteer and fight in the war. Well, what happens? You know, all sorts of regulations had to be passed in order to enable them to keep their places open, this sort of thing. Um, and they, there was a great sharing of, of expertise. The immediate reaction was, ah, you know, we, we're losing all this income, we're, we're in a terrible state, uh, we don't want to, to lose our staff, although many staff, of course, were also going off to fight in the war. So the immediate reaction was a fairly sort of familiar one in universities of this sort of, of this sort of were faced by this sort of problem. So any staff vacancies were left unfilled. Uh, there was an immediate cut in in university in departmental grants uh, to stop to reduce departmental expenditures. Key one maintenance of buildings, maintenance of grounds was immediately suspended. And you started to get the universities looking at a reorganization of teaching activities. Um, you know, how do we share teaching? Can we combine classes, this sort of thing. And there were big debates in many universities about voluntary salary reductions. Um, good example of this was in Cardiff. Um, where what was then the University of, of Monmouthshire in South Wales, University of Cardiff. Um, a lot of staff volunteered to take really almost half of their salaries uh, to make a contribution to the, to the financial problems facing the, the university. Um, it became quite a, sort of quite controversial, not least because the government uh, didn't like this approach at all. Uh, there was a feeling that actually this would have an adverse effect on morale, uh, not just in the universities but beyond, um, and actually government was quite keen not to see voluntary staff salary savings. And that actually feeds into the debate that went on about um, getting government help. Now, go back a bit. Um, I was saying that before the war, universities were very sort of independent from, from government. Government funding was a quarter of, of their income, roughly. Um, and actually, government had very little influence. It didn't want any influence. It, the view in government was that the universities are independent bodies. They can do what they like as long as they pay their way independently. Uh, Crisis affects the universities and this outbreak of the war. And so what happens, the universities feel that there's nowhere else they can go but to turn to government. And the ball was sort of started in Scotland. Uh, January 1915, the Scottish universities uh, wrote, all got together. Um, and there were four Scottish universities at that time, Aberdeen, St Andrews, Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, and they wrote to government uh, basically saying that they've, they've taken, they've made all the savings they can, they've tried to increase their efficiency, but they still can't cope and they're facing this, this great drop in income. Um, you know, and they appeal to government for, for special funding. And this is a very important uh, document. It's part of the response of government in early 1915. And government responds to the Scottish universities and to others. Um, I say it's, Scotland led the way, but very quickly followed by the Northern universities uh, and by the London colleges. Um, and government reacted by saying that, well, first of all, considering whether when a one option was do nothing and we'll sort it all out when the war is over. That was one option. Uh, but they actually came to the conclusion that there could be more harm done and harm that couldn't be reversed at the end of the war if, they, if government did nothing. And so actually 
uh, government starts to think about prepare, offering some sort of special grant to universities to help them get through this. Lloyd George, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time, was very supportive of this. Um, and the universities found quite a sort of willing voice when they talked to Lloyd George. They did not find so much of a willing voice later on when he had moved from the Exchequer. Um, but the reaction then was that government um, basically said, yes, we will, we're happy to, we will find some money to help the universities, but this is not a blank check. Government started to say, if we give you some assistance, then actually we want to be able to know what that money's being spent on. We want to come into the universities to be able to see how they're run, to make sure that money is being used effectively and properly. And this, of course, is what some universities had always feared, that actually by having to go to government for funding, and if government said yes, then actually government would add strings to it. And that is exactly what happened. So that January 1915 memorandum <laughs> is a very important document. It emphasizes that, that there were, I only gave a short extract from it, but the, the document talks about the tension between should we help the universities or should we actually you know, everybody else in society were sort of having to make big savings. Why were the universities any different? That was a view in some parts of government. Um, but it does talk about this, this sort of growing assumption that actually government did have a role. It couldn't just stand aside. And that um, in return for that assistance, universities would actually lose some of their sort of independence and would be subject to much more intrusive scrutiny. The memorandum also looks ahead to the end of the war and foresees a growing role for universities in the reconstruction at the end of the war. So it's a, it's a document which already starts sort of preparing the ground for the big meeting in 1918. Um, Although at that time, um, things were still sort of working their way through. The government agreed to make available £145,000 as a special funding for universities. Um, in fact, in the end, only about 130000 of it was spent. Uh, so it agreed to make special grants available to universities to cover fee losses. It wasn't a sort of... As I say, it wasn't a blank check. It was intended to cover, compensate for those losses. Um, what was interesting and actually helped universities was that in, those, in that crisis period, there was great fear that those other sources of income would also decline. Universities thought that local authorities would pull out of funding completely. They didn't. Um, and they also thought that especially interest earned on endowments and so on would also collapse. It didn't. So actually by 1916, uh, other sources of income had really held fairly steady. You've got some government grants coming in. Uh, they'd already made quite significant expenditure reductions. So actually by 1916, things had stabilized a bit. And the universities were beginning to look forwards. So, phase two of the war. You see lots of changing attitudes. Um, you know, government now accepting some sort of responsibility for universities. Universities looking to government for support. Uh, the two sides, which had initially had been way apart, had sort of been forced together through the war. Uh, and government looking for accountability as part of the, the deal. Um, there was also a big push for universities to work more with business and industry. Uh, again, before the war, 
there'd been some contacts, but in many ways they'd been operating in different worlds. One of the things the war did very, in very stark terms was show how backward British industry had been in 1913-14, and actually how dependent British industry was at that time on imports of raw materials, but also finished goods, uh, especially, and of course this was the issue, from Germany. Those imports uh, were cut off in 1914, and British industry had to try and respond. Uh, and in a way, again, that pushed universities and industry together. There was growing interest in the population as well through this in terms of looking towards science and engineering as, as subjects that were important to study. Um, I talk about universities coming out from the shadows. Um, they, the universities played a big part in the war effort. Uh, if we're talking about munitions work, you had students and staff working in hospitals, public health, uh, growing interest in social problems, uh, social problems linked to the war. You started to see the emergence of social sciences departments uh, in several, Manchester and Liverpool are very good examples of this. Uh, their sort of interest in things like social work uh, really dates back to the latter years of the First World War. And there was a new emphasis on the importance of research. So you start seeing, you start seeing changes. And this all sort of feeds in, it's not just within the universities, you start seeing changing attitudes in, in government as well. And it feeds into a, well, I think it's a, a, a quite momentous paper written in March 1918 by somebody called Alan Kidd, who was uh, secretary to the university committee, the Committee on University Grants. He subsequently became secretary to the University Grants Committee at the UGC uh, when it was founded. Uh, so he was a civil servant, but I think a very sort of enlightened, forward-looking sort of civil servant. And he wrote this famous paper in 1918, which is really looking forwards. And some of the language is, is very important and really marks this sort of shift in thinking that I've been trying to, to, to describe. Uh, so he talks about the importance of certain subjects for not just the war effort, but for the position after the war, science and technology. Foreign languages, and of course foreign languages is another area that actually was stimulated hugely by the First World War. Um, he also talks about, um, you know, the, the modern universities, the, the modern universities equals Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, Durham, so on, not the Newcastle bit of Durham. Um, they were often called the modern universities. Um, and you know, he talks about trying to expand the, the sort of humanities side of those universities as well. And he talks about in building the links between industry and universities. Um, he also talks a lot about expanding student numbers. How do we sort of, how do we increase numbers? How do we provide opportunities? for people from social groups that previously had not looked to universities, how do we increase opportunities? This was, this was widening participation being discussed in 1918. And he was talking about providing more scholarships, maintenance allowances to help students from um, deprived backgrounds enter universities. He was talking about possible expansion in the number of universities. So some of those university colleges becoming full universities. Uh, he's, he's, you know, terms that he uses are very sort of familiar. You know, he talks a lot about access, you know, very much part of the language that we might use today. Um, so, you know, he's, he's really beginning to, to shift things on. But actually, my feeling is that there's a key part of his paper where 
he is the first person who starts talking about universities as part of a national, what he calls a national scheme. He starts presenting universities not as individual institutions, but he starts mapping out a, a view of universities as part of a national system of, of it, higher education. He's actually one of the first people to use the actual term higher education. Um, previously, you were very much just talking about the universities. Um, so things are moving on. Things are changing. And this is all the build-up to the university's deputation, 1918. So you had government recognizing that there needed to be change. You had, had universities recognizing that there needed to be change. And these two sort of forces come together. And there was, throughout much of 1918, a, a, lot of, a, a view, a growing view, that there needed to be some sort of big meeting to pull this all together. Finally, the meeting was agreed for November 1918. Uh, it was not, now that date first emerges back in the spring of 1918, so that's before the war had, had actually ended. Um, but there were long debates about uh, the, the actual format of this meeting, what it was going to, who was going to be invited. So at one point, uh, the view was that it should be only English universities and only English universities receiving any sort of government funding. So that would have excluded Oxford and Cambridge. Um, but then it was agreed, no, it needed to be a whole all of England. But then what about Scotland? What about Wales? What about Ireland? Um, so all these discussions were going on through, no, through 1918. Also big discussions about what the agenda would be for this meeting. Um, and a new issue begins to appear through 1918, which had been there before the war, had been sort of put on one side in the early years of the war, and then re-emerges very strongly at the end of the war. And that's all to do with staff salaries and staff conditions of employment. Conditions of employment was very much an issue of, of career structure. Before the war, you had professors and you had lecturers. There was nothing in between. And there was growing discontent uh, suggesting that actually you know, not every lecturer was going to become a professor, so actually there needed to be some sort of structure in the middle. Uh, but that would cost money, because the implication of that was that the people in the middle would actually get more, earn more than people at the bottom. So you see a, a sort of uh, staffing salaries became an, an issue. Also linked with that were issues about status growing concern towards the end of the war that actually the academic profession was of was sort of low was becoming seen as lower status um, and all of these things began to emerge so not just the funding things not just changing attitudes to research but actually staffing begins to to become quite a big issue it all comes to a climax on Saturday the 23rd of November 1918 at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, in London um, and that meeting was attended by representatives from almost every university in the country um, and that it did include Scotland and it did include Wales and it did include Ireland and of course Ireland then was the whole of Ireland um, and the universities were all represented. Um, some of the key players at this meeting, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer attended, uh, President of the Board of Education, Herbert Fisher. Herbert Fisher's an interesting character. Fisher started the war as Vice Chancellor of the University of Sheffield. Um, and if you're interested, his parliamentary constituency was what we would now see, or what we used to see, as Nick Clegg's constituency. He was, uh, Herbert Fisher became MP for uh, the Sheffield Hallam Ward. Um, 
interesting character, clearly saw the development of higher education in terms of a national system. It was him who pushed for the Scottish universities, the Irish universities, the Welsh universities to be at this meeting, and for Oxford and Cambridge as well. Very important figure in the developments immediately after the war. Balfour didn't actually attend, but when you read the minutes of the meeting, he was often quoted. Um, Balfour had been across to the United States during the war and had come back with all sorts of ideas about how British universities should change to be more like American universities. Um, and so he's often quoted in, in the meeting, even though he didn't actually attend. Uh, McCormick, very important, also a very important character, and Kidd, who I've just mentioned. As I say, universities, there were lots of universities there, just to pick on a few of the key figures. Oliver Lodge, principal at Birmingham, emerged as the university's leader. Uh, he was their, their spokesman both immediately before the, the, the meeting and during the meeting. Other people who said a lot in the meeting uh, included the principal of Edinburgh, principal of Glasgow, uh, Vice Chancellor of Liverpool and the Provost of UCL. Um, others contributed, but they were sort of key key people. Uh, I won't go through these in any detail, but they, they um, this was just a little bit of a quote from, from what Oliver Lodge was saying. One of the things he talked a lot about was this issue about staffing. How um, important it was to give young staff uh, a career structure. Um, he contrasted the position facing young lecturers with other professions um, and how important it was for them to be rewarded. Rewarded not just in terms of salary, but also rewarded in terms of time and resources to undertake research. Um, that he, he talks about you can't leave it all to outside funding, uh, project-based funding to help young staff. You need to have sort of other sources of income. Um, again, uh, this is a quick quote from uh, the principal of Edinburgh, but again, he's talking about, uh, he, one of the things he argues for a lot in the meeting is to do with funding and the need for capital funding, not just grant, recurrent grant type funding. Um, so, you know, he talks about you can't just rely on local wealthy people to give us some money for a building. We actually have to have some sort of basic level of funding. Just a very quick summary of the sort of issues that were discussed during the day. Um, they talked about changing attitude of government, government accepting some degree of responsibility. Uh, and there is a lot of discussion in the meeting about changing attitudes within Treasury. A view that Treasury had not wanted to fund universities at all, uh, had always been sort of dragged uh, screaming into giving any sort of money for universities, but a feeling that this was changing. That e There's a, some quotes, even within Treasury, uh, views are changing. There's a lot of discussion about international comparisons, how British universities are lagging behind Germany, and that, of course, was seen as very sensitive, um, but also the United States. Um, there was a growing view that the United States was really the sort of growing powerhouse of, of higher education, and Britain needed to catch up and, uh, and be on a level terms with the United States. Lots of discussion about funding of universities and especially about capital funding, the need for capital funding. Um, again, lots of talk about student numbers. How do we increase student numbers? How do we increase opportunities for groups within society who are traditionally underrepresented in universities? And going with that, how do we actually fund not just the universities, but how do we fund the students? All sounds remarkably familiar. Um, and 
there was, you know, there was a strong view at this expressed at this meeting that actually a system of university of of grants, maintenance grants for students should be introduced. There was also a view that fees should be standardized. That instead of having this huge range of different fees that I talked about earlier, there should be single fees to cover all aspects of, of activity within a university. And that there should be lots of scholarships and bursaries made available, including with government funding, to assist that process. Just as a little aside, in the last year of the war, there was also a a white paper produced on the future of science within Britain and that was coming to very similar conclusions that needed to have more people entering science in universities and that to do that you had to give bursaries scholarships to support it. There are issues about governance of British universities, uh, especially about the lay members of councils. Um, there's a wonderful quote from a member from a uh, in some of the earlier papers, a treasury source, saying that they didn't see why members of university councils should make money from their role working within their universities. And at this meeting, that is very, very vigorously refuted, that saying that actually these people give up their time voluntarily and they're not making any money themselves. Um, that's an issue we might come back to because there is some evidence that members of council did make some money. But anyway, um, issues about attracting international students. Um, now, this is very much tied up with the PhD. 1917-18 is the hundredth anniversary. Now, we're the hundredth anniversary of the introduction of the PhD in this country, and it came out of what was happening before the war was lots of students, especially from North America, going to Germany for a PhD. And Britain wanted to get in and replace Germany in that way. So it's how, to, how do we attract these students? Issues of salaries, conditions of employment, all very discussed in a big way. Opportunities, how do we encourage staff to undertake research? How do we make sure that is the right sort of research? Um, that was a key thing, and the importance of research within universities. There's a, for, for the sort of technically minded, there's a, there's a section within the meeting when they got into taxation arrangements for industry funding university research, and could, you, could industry actually claim taxation back out of this? Um, lots of issues about links between universities and business and about the autonomy of universities. Just nearly finished. Um, basically, and this is entirely predictable, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the President of the Board of Education, uh, who at the end gave their response to all of these areas of discussion, uh, basically said, Yes, we think this is good. We, we recognize the importance of universities. This is very important. They had they were greeted by cheering within the room. Vice, these vice chancellors were all cheering. Um, and, uh, but you'll notice there is no firm commitments. Uh, lots of nice words, but no firm commitments. I think this is my last slide. It is. Um, so just to sort of summarize a little bit about the importance of this deputation. It was, in some ways, it was the climax of all the changes that had been happening during the war, all the different pressures, the changing attitudes. Before the war, you would not have got all those universities looking to government for funding. They were scared to look to government for funding. They didn't think government would fund them. It was a different world. 1918, the universities now are looking increasingly to government, not only for ongoing recurrent support, but also for capital funding. And equally, government, which before the war wouldn't have gone anywhere near this, actually now begins to see that this is an important area of activity and does recognize some responsibility to support the universities. So new funding arrangements begin to emerge. They don't emerge 
immediately in, in November 1918, but they do start to emerge in 1919. The meeting led directly to the establishment of the University Grants Committee, the UGC, in 1919. And of course, the UGC was to go on to play a pivotal role in the development of higher education throughout virtually the whole of the 20th century. Um, you did have attempts to broaden access. Um, you did have, you know, growing attempts to sort of introduce new, new salaries and new career structures. And you do move soon after to a structure of lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, professor, uh, which is you know, familiar to many of us still today. Um, so you do, you know, it did lead into this. It didn't happen immediately. Um, and of course, what also happened was that the structures changed, but the funding was a bit of a problem. And any of you who are familiar with some of the economic problems of the 1920s and 30s uh, will soon recognize that actually what was happening here was that lots of extra commitments were being entered into and expanded, but actually the resources struggled to keep pace with that. Um, you had increasing postgraduate activity, but I, I will argue that the key aspect of this is this whole development of a, of a national system. Before the war, you would not have even got those vice chancellors sitting down together. Uh, at the end of the war, they're not only sitting down together, they're talking together, they're talking as one, and they are talking to government. And it is no coincidence that the years 1918-19 see the establishment of three of the bodies that were going to shape higher education through the 20th century. The UGC, the CVCP, now Universities UK, and the AUT. So you had, if you like, the government's funding body, you had the representative body of the universities, and the representative body of staff in universities all emerging at that time. So for me, that is a pivotal meeting. It's a crucial meeting. It's one that helped to shape higher education universities through the 20th century. It very much reflected what happened in the war years and the changes in the war years. Uh, but for me, it's a pivotal meeting and one that I think deserves to be up there with uh, some of those other key reports uh, that I mentioned right at the start. That's it. <laughs> I've got lots of things to say, John, but <laughs> I found that really, really interesting. <coughs> when I first started to work at the university, I worked in the Department of Continuing Education. <coughs> and at the time, there was somebody there called Keith Percy, mm -hmm. who was mentioned when we had our 50th anniversary. And he'd originally been involved in this department of education. But that continuing education, and then linking back to your comments about the leave and the, the sort of profile. So that, that profile of the, <coughs> the lead proportion of students in the lead. I mean, I suppose you made the comment that there's, there are some notable different, you know, so in terms of the increase in the mature students, mm. part-time students, all that evening provision. Mm. And over the years, I've worked with various colleagues in lead who have had similarly got continuing education. And all that sort of lost to some extent. Mm. And yet now we've now got universities thinking about what's their contribution to their communities or to their regions. And I, and I wondered if there was anything you wanted to perhaps just comment on in relation to that broader yeah. area. I, there's no doubt, you know, what you, when you're looking at universities at this sort of period, it's interesting because you're looking at, compared with, with what we're familiar with today, much smaller institutions. And yet actually, in many ways, in terms of their provision, their courses, their educational provision, actually in many ways more complex. Um, and, you know, s s academic staff were expected to contribute across the board. You know, they, you weren't just expected to teach your course at, to, to undergraduate students. You were expected to give your evening classes and your adult education classes as well as, uh, not instead of, but as well as. Um, so, you know, there was a greater range and 
um, the, the, the staff had to sort of undertake that sort of wider range of commitments. There was, there was a strong sense of serving your region. And you need, you know, in some ways you need to go back to the origins of some of these colleges that were established. They were commonly established by wealthy industrialists. So the people who, who really were behind Leeds and Sheffield and Liverpool and Manchester and Birmingham and, uh, and so on were you know, normally wealthy local business men. Um, and so the, in one sense, there was, a, there was that sort of regional commitment. And a lot of these universities from their early days delivered you know, adult education programs for the local businesses. Sheffield's a very good example. I've done quite a lot of work about the, the adult education programs at Sheffield. And it's very much geared to the steel industry of Sheffield at the time. Um, but, um, but what's also interesting is that at the same, whilst they had that sort of regional commitment, they were also quite sort of um, quite separate in some ways. And there's some lovely quotes uh, I've got about people saying, we don't know what goes on in the university. And this is people living in the same, same city, um, just down the road from the university in one case. Um, but they don't know what, what's going on. It's a sort of different world in some respects. And partly this is the industrialists themselves who sort of wanted it both ways. They wanted to have a university that served some of their sort of training needs. But they also quite wanted a university that had the sort of respectability of a, of a classics department or, a, or, a, or an arts department or something. Um, so you get this sort of strange mixture in, in, in some respects. But they, 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 had a, they did have a regional commitment. And actually, in terms of their student numbers, um, well, the Leeds figures I quoted there, I, there's, there's a figure I didn't quote there for Leeds, and that is that at that time, there were more students coming from outside of the UK to Leeds than there were from students coming from, the, from Britain outside of the West Riding, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there were quite large, the, I, my, from memory, there were about 50 or 60 international students studying in Leeds when the total population was just over a thousand. They were coming from Australia and often from sort of empire countries, Australia, uh, India was common, uh, Egypt was also common. Um, and we're, we're coming to, but what the university wasn't doing was really drawing large numbers of students from outside of the West Riding. And that, you go back to the idea that the vast majority of those students were living at home. So it had to be within a bus ride or a train journey of, of the centre of Leeds. Um, and you know, that was very much what drove it. Okay, uh, thank you, Sam, for that. It was really interesting to um, know more about that particular thing in particular. And I guess what I'm particularly interested in is um, your opinion on what has happened in between, so in 100 years. So I guess my question is why some of the concerns and some of the issues are repeated? Nowadays, why do you think that? I think you, of course, I'm not asking you to answer this question because it's a complex. But um, I think I'm interested in the similarities and differences of the issues that you're, for example, you're, you're listening to when you talk about the importance of education. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's in. Uh, no, let me start. I, I, I'm not somebody who believes that uh, you know you can always learn large amounts from from history I think I think I think an awareness is is quite important but I don't but things don't repeat themselves circumstances are never exactly the same and, and, and so on um, so I'm not saying I'm not somebody who says that you know just because these you know there are necessarily lessons to be learned mm -hmm. having said that I do find it fascinating that some of the issues that were being very 
widely discussed in 1918, you know, do, do have a distinct similarity to issues today. So they were talking a lot about how do we encourage, now in Liverpool, they were talking about how do we encourage students from the poorest parts of Liverpool to enter, to, to you know, aspire to coming to university. Um, and, you know, that's a, those debates are still going on in, in, in Liverpool and in other cities, other universities. Uh, I do think that's of interest. Um, you know, the fact that there the, were some of the discussions about funding, and especially this, this tension between funding and university autonomy. You know, the universities were really worried about taking money from the, unit, from the government and then being faced with all sorts of conditions attached to it. And that, I, I mentioned at one point that when those funds were given, £140,000 was allocated, and actually a fair chunk of it was unspent. And that was because some universities, in fact, chose not to take up their, their allocations. So this tension between university autonomy and independence and funding, and a feeling that funding implies conditions, uh, strings attached, um, you know, it is a debate that is still relevant today. Um, so you've, you've, you've got some of these things. What, what's also interesting, I think, viewing in a much longer time um, frame, is how, what was, you know, I've written a paper based on some of this, which is, which is sort of arguing that the First World War and the immediate consequences of it represent the sort of foundation of, of, the pub, of the idea of a public university in this country. Now, it's interesting because in some ways, the 20th century is a period of the public university. But in a way, we're almost challenging that today and things are moving away from it. So I, again, I'm sort of interested in some of the parallels between you know, what those universities were looking like before this period and you know, some of the ideas now. What I, what's fascinating for me is actually some of the sort of, again, some of the similarities. You go back to that picture I drew of the, of the income of universities before the war. You would be amazed at how entrepreneurial the universities were before the First World War. Um, I've done a fair bit of work at, at Leeds and, and Liverpool, and both those universities, they would be going out, marketing, advertising, you know, hold your meetings in one of our meetings, you know, to, to societies, local government, all sorts. Come and use our facilities, and, you know, this is what it will cost you. Um, in a very entrepreneurial way. So, yeah, I think there are some, some interesting sort of comparisons and, and similarities. If you say what's happened in between, I, well, I, I, I would say that one of the big problems has been um, an inconsistency, inconsistencies within government because, yeah, and in a way, that's the, that's the untold story that, do next time, if you like, um, which, you know, the, the, in 1918, they were sort of setting up all these sort of ideas of, of changing things. But in the end, that all requires money. Uh, you know, most, they were talking about, you know, how do we fund extra students to enter higher education? Needed money to pay for grants, to pay for scholarships, bursaries, and so on. How do, we, how do we build more links between business and in, uh, universities and business? It required money. And what, what's a great disappointment was that in 1918, actually within the universities, you had this, this great, they sort of got over this feeling that government was going, to, you know, they, they'd begun to recognize that they had to look to government for funding. Um, but then, of course, and government was saying some quite encouraging things. But then we get into the 1920s, 1930s, and there isn't government money there. They, you know, it's a time of savings, um, cuts in, in funding of, of government activities, not just universities, but generally. 
And I suppose I think part of the problem is long term problem is just this sort of inconsistency between what government wants and what government's willing to pay for. And that comes back to even wider issues about levels of taxation and, and so on. You know, it's, it's a sort of inconsistency between what society wants and what society is willing to pay for. So it's a kind of a larger systemic and structural issue. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Is that going online? No. I just was just very interested about the date. You talked about mm. the date, how the date had been planned earlier in the year, and it was just two weeks after the armistice. Yep. And, mm. and it must have been what an interesting and very sorrowful day it yes. was for all those people meeting up for all sorts of parts of the country. I wonder if any of that ever comes through in the in what it, you've got just It does a bit. Uh, you know, at the start of the of the meeting, um, you know, there were sort of prayers said, and um, you know, there was sort of a, a, several of the speakers talk about, uh, you know, the sort of sadness of the war, uh, the contribution that universities made to the war. I, you know, I, I barely covered that, but you know, the universities played a big part in in, in all sorts of ways during the war, um, and you know. I think that's part of the sort of uh, opening up of the universities to, to society. The fact that you had students in the hospitals, you had students in the fields picking crops, you had students uh, making munitions and so on, and in so doing, rubbing shoulders with other people in their communities making, making munitions and out in the fields, I think had a big sort of... Uh, was part of this opening up process that, that I described. Um, but yeah, the war, you know, it made a very sort of, it was, it, I, it was quite a solemn meeting at the start anyway. I, I think by the end, it, it's funny because there are various places where they talk about, you know, the, this, I mentioned quoted one of them with cheering of, uh, and so on. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure I can quite imagine um, <laughs> 40 vice chancellors sitting in a room and cheering uh, at, at the top of their voices, it says, actually. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it is quite interesting to, to think, but it was, it was solemn. Um, yeah, the date had been fixed back in April of the year. Um, and um, so, and they stuck to it. But, um, yeah, it was, but actually it's an interesting, there's a wider thing. It, one of the ways in which the, the government operated quite a lot was by bringing people down to London for these sort of big meetings, not just in education but in other things as well. Um, and you get lots of interesting things in university accounts about expenses claimed for going down to London. <laughs> Nothing's changed then. No. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you Sorry, very much. Yes, uh, you can have your hand up, Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't ask to be told off. Sorry. Um, uh, I'm interested that you uh, emphasise the continuity of it now. Clearly, there's a lot of discontinuity. Yeah. So probably age participation, probably five percent mm -hmm. or something around this time. Maybe a bit less. Yes. Because only eight percent. Yeah. In the seventies, so. It, but, but, but it, uh, you're right in terms of age participation as an overall statistic. But what I would also say is that actually you had, you possibly, uh, you did uh, still have quite a wide range of ages represented in, in, in universities. You know, you had, partly because such a high proportion were studying part-time. So uh, you're, you're, I'm, I'm not, I'm agreeing with you, but, but I think it's, it's a sort of subtlety to it as well. But it, but it, but it was still a very much an elite education. Oh, yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, how, how, how do you, you know, so, 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 so given you, given you got the side similarities with the debate now, what, what, what can you have clear as differences with pay now and then? Well, uh, okay, you've, you've part, participated, you know, they would never have, have dreamt of, of participation rates, you know, above sort of, Oh, they, they wouldn't. They, they they were conscious that it was low, and they were conscious that they wanted to uh, get into some of the poorest elements of society. 
but you know ideas of participation rates you know above sort of above 50 percent or something would have been inconceivable um, so that that's a, a, a massive change um, you know, if you're talking about other areas of change, the, the, the way in which they taught students was, a, was a, is just hugely different. Um, although, again, another interesting thing that begins to develop around this period is the use of the seminar. Um, you know, before the war, um, it was very much just straight lectures, nothing else. Um, in Germany before the war, they had begun to use smaller group teaching seminars uh, and also teaching where students could contribute in some way. Uh, that was unheard of in this country before the war. It began to develop during the war, uh, but certainly massive differences there. The whole scale of research is another big thing. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of academic staff were not before the war and even in the years after the war were not doing research at all and their universities weren't interested in them doing research uh, you know research was something that you did if you were lucky enough to know somebody who would give you a bit of money to, to fund it uh, you know there was the medical research council was the first research council in the country it had been founded in 1911 as part of the national insurance act um, that was the start. During the war, you had the Department of Scientific Investigation and Research founded in government. That led on to the research councils in the interwar years. But, um, you know, research activity was still incredibly low level. So that's another massive, massive change. And, there, but, and, and in a way, it's the, there was no expectation that you'd do research. Um, that there's a wonderful set of quotes from an Oxford professor of chemistry who basically, this was in the 1890s, who basically says research is not something that a university academic should be doing. It's, it's, it's sort of almost it's a bit disgraceful to be thinking about doing research. Um, and that was quite a widely held view. And, it, and you know, that's part of what, what I argue, that the war helped to change that by showing the importance of, of research. You know, the war First of all, war is characterized often as the war of the chemists because of all the, the, the poison gas and, and so on. Um, and, and there is no doubt that the war did actually throw a new light on the importance of scientific research um, and a feeling that Britain was falling behind and needed to develop in this area. But it's a slow process. That's interesting. Oh yes. Oh, uh, no, no. Yeah, no, no question about it. That, that yeah, you know, the go the golden age was post 1945. Um. Okay. Okay. Um, our next seminar is on the 8th of um, November, and it is. Miriam Strady from the School of Computing here at Lancaster. I hope you can all join us then. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.